really nice to be here, and uh, I owe a big um, debt to uh, the Anabios folks. Uh, when we first uh, moved to Dallas from University of Arizona in 2014, I uh, wanted to do something uh, different. My lab had uh, almost entirely worked on uh, mouse and, and sometimes rat models of of pain, and I uh, was feeling pretty unsatisfied with that direction. And uh, Paul and I had some discussion about uh, getting some DRGs from Anabios and starting on RNA sequencing. So RNA sequencing was, you know, just starting to kind of take off at that time. I'm not sure who actually was the first one to do RNA sequencing on human DRGs. It was probably either me or, or Mike Anarola. Uh, Might have been Mike actually, but um, we. Uh, uh, got some DRGs from Anabios and uh, started doing the sequencing. We basically never looked back, so we, we pretty much transformed our lab from a, a primarily uh, mouse uh, neuropathic pain uh, uh, mechanism lab to almost entirely uh, focusing on working with uh, human tissues. Now. So I'm going to tell you all today about uh, the kind of a broad overview of the work we do on the uh, dorsal root ganglion and on the spinal cord. and. Um, Another thing uh, that we do in our lab is we, we've spun a, a bunch of companies out of the lab. So um, here, here are uh, three. Um, Doloromics is based in San Francisco, actually. Chris Flores is here. He, he and I and Kent Candler Page and Jackson Brower uh, co-founded this company. Uh, the, the idea behind this company is to come up with better targets based on um, human sequencing data and a, a computational algorithm called Dolores that uh, we have uh, developed. And, you know, could talk to Chris or I more about that um, company. I'll talk a little bit about it uh, during my talk. Um, 40 Therapeutics is a company that's developing mink inhibitors for neuropathic pain. I'll talk a little bit about that too. And then I have a company called Parmedics that's developing PAR2 antagonists for uh, migraine and uh, uh, osteoarthritis. So we already talked quite a bit about the, the big problem that uh, chronic pain uh, presents. My, my lab and uh, our research focus is mostly on neuropathic pain. I think this is an area where the problem is uh, particularly severe. The drugs that exist really don't work very well at all for um, most patients. And there's a, a pretty urgent need. I definitely agree that we're in a race to try to solve this. And I, I just don't believe any more the animal models are going to get us there. So that's uh, the major reason that we have um, spent so much effort uh, focusing on uh, human dorsal root ganglion and now human spinal cord. Um, the numbers that I have here only represent um, non-diabetic neuropathic pain. If you include diabetic neuropathic pain, it adds another 40 million people. So, you know, uh, collectively it's about 10 to 15 percent of the population. And for diabetic neuropathic pain, I, I think, you know, we have really poor animal models to begin with, and we really need to make advances on understanding the, the human um, disease, which I, I will talk about a little bit today. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some published work and also talk a little bit about some unpublished work. So. Uh, starting with the published work. So um, one of the things that we wanted to achieve after we had done the kind of basic bulk um, sequencing, et cetera, that we, we published a couple of years ago, was to try to really drill down into um, single neuron transcriptomes for uh, human DRG uh, neurons. And um, there are a couple, di couple different groups that are working on this. There are about uh, three papers that I think have been uh, published now, one um, from us, one from Steve Davidson and Nick Reba at NIH, and then uh, another one from a group that uh, used to be at uh, Genentech that were just published in uh, Nature Communications. We used a, a slightly different approach in the work that Deanna and, and um, Stephanie did. We used uh, spatial transcriptomics. I'll, I'll tell you about how, how we did that. But first, I want to hi highlight the uh, setup that we've established um, at uh, UT Dallas and also with some collaborators at UT Southwestern through the Southwest Transplant Alliance. So the Southwest Transplant Alliance is the um, biggest organ procurement agency in the southern United States. They're, they're based in Dallas. They're about uh, five miles from us at UTD, which is a really amazing accident of geography. I had no idea about this when I, I moved uh, to Dallas in 2014. We've, we've established a really amazing relationship with them, much, much like Anabios has with many other um, uh, transplant uh, groups around the uh, country. The way that we work with the Southwest Transplant Alliance is that we, we go into the operating room with them um, about three times a week at uh, this point, and uh, we recover uh, dorsal root ganglion, spinal cord, um, sciatic nerves, 
Uh, sympathetic ganglia, we're doing a lot of profiling on sympathetic ganglia. I won't talk about the, that today, but uh, the talk, the keynote yesterday was really inspiring from that perspective, so I'm even more excited to, to dive into that more. And then uh, we freeze a lot of the tissue when we're um, in the operating room, but then we've also developed techniques to um, keep the DRGs and spinal cord alive, bring them back to our lab, and now we're doing uh, more and more functional assays. So we do um, MEA electrophysiology on human DRG neurons, we do some patch clamp electrophysiology, uh, we're doing calcium imaging, and then we've also kind of developed a lot of signaling um, assays. I think that really is kind of something that falls in our wheelhouse, so that's something that we're going to be doing uh, more and more of as time goes by, and then we're trying to compete with Mike on doing spinal cord uh, recordings, but uh, th that, that's tough. I think, I think probably we need, to, you know, 15 or 20 labs around around the country, including Anabios as well, uh, doing this work. I mean, it's really important to try to make as much advances as we can. And then we're also super, we try to be super open with people about how we do this, and we've been trying to um, train other groups um, in how to work with the uh, organ transplant procurement agencies so that more academic labs can uh, be doing this work. And I also owe a big debt to Rob Jarreau's lab at WashU who came down and helped us, and of course, Rob and Anabios worked together to get uh, much of this up and going um, about 10 years ago. All right, so um, spatial transcriptomics, we heard a, a bit about um, single cell uh, sequencing in, a in several different talks yesterday. I think we have one mention of spatial transcriptomics. We've used the um, Visium technology from uh, 10X Genomics. This uh, technology has um, kind of low resolution now that, that there have been a, a number of other technologies that, that have come out, but um, it's pretty ideal for working with dorsal root ganglion, and, and the reason for that is really simple. DRG, human DRG neurons are really, really big, and um, they're spaced out kind of nicely to, to work with these 50, 55 micron spots that are on these slides. So essentially what you do here is you um, slice your tissue section, and then you place it onto one of these slides, and then um, you uh, image by, well, you stain the slide and then you uh, image, and then you elute the RNA down and, and uh, uh, anneal it to the barcodes that are found on the slide, and that allows you to do um, sequencing registered to the image that you have. So we uh, have been manually assigning barcodes to either neurons, so meaning that there's a single neuron that overlaps with the barcode. Sometimes there's multiple neurons, but it's typically just one neuron. Or barcodes that surround or are outside of a neuronal area altogether, and then that, that allows us to analyze our sequencing data. And um, so far, we've focused uh, mostly on uh, the neuronal barcodes, although I'll, I'll tell you a little bit uh, towards the end of the talk about how we're kind of deconvoluting <coughs> the cell types that are found in the non-neuronal um, barcodes. So we um, assign um, labels to 12 different subtypes of sensory neurons in this paper, and, and we also we took a little bit different approach than has been used in many of the mouse RNA sequencing papers that have been published so far. And the reason for that was uh, really, really simple. Um, we had, had found previous to um, getting this data, but the data, the spatial data certainly supported it, that. Um, there really are not non-peptidergic uh, human sensory neurons. So for those of you that are, are um, uh, committed peripheralists, you are probably very well aware of this idea of peptidergic and non-peptidergic neurons from the, the rodent literature. And if you look at the sequencing papers from m many, many different labs, you're gonna find that the labels that are assigned to the sensory neurons are either PEP or NP, NP standing for non-peptidergic. And given that there really are no non-peptidergic neurons in the human DRG, we, th we thought that that didn't make any sense. So what we tried to do was to assign um, functional labels to them. Um, we understood when we did that that um, we were going a little bit out on a limb here, but I'm going to tell you in the coming slides about how we think we can support that data and try to better understand this. I, th I think it's really, really important to move away from um, labeling the uh, neuronal populations in terms of you know, what genes they express and to try to um, assign uh, functionality to them. I, I know that's gonna be a hard problem, but I think we really need to do it because ultimately you know, we can learn from understanding how these populations might change in people that have chronic pain and you know, uh, understand the symptoms that they have to understand which populations of um, uh, sensory neurons we wanna target with therapeutics.
So um, all this information is in, in the paper, but you could ask, you know, how, how did we know that um, uh, human sensory neurons don't fall into these peptidergic and non-peptidergic classes? Well, for, first of all, almost all of the um, human uh, sensory neurons that express both TRPI-1 and NAV1.8, which are two very important markers uh, for nociceptors, also express CGRP. And uh, the other way that we know this is, which we validated with RNA scope um, from the ACD uh, folks. We've been a very good uh, customer of theirs, and they've, they've also helped us uh, tremendously in the work that we've done. Um, we uh, looked at the track A receptor, so the receptor for NGF. So if you're familiar with the uh, rodent literature, you'll know that all sensory neurons when they're born express the track A receptor. They require NGF for their early development. But soon after birth, half of them turn off um, TREK-A uh, gene expression, and those neurons become the non-peptidergic subset. In human adults, so these are DRGs taken from organ donors ranging, ranging from 30 to, to 65 years old in this paper, we see that all of the uh, nociceptors express the TREK-A receptor. So clearly, there's not a population of neurons that's turning off uh, the, the TREK-A receptor. And we do also see that um, the TREK-B receptor, with the receptor for BDNF, is primarily expressed by larger diameter neurons. So it seems to be like the nociceptors in humans are marked by TREK-A, and then the proprioceptors and the um, uh, low-threshold mechanoreceptors are marked by uh, TREK-B. So we can dive deeper into uh, genes that are specifically expressed in these populations, and I'm just gonna focus on uh, two in particular because I, I think they create some um, important examples for uh, two different reasons. So the, the one on the left are the um, putative um, silent nociceptors. So um, silent nociceptors are uh, pretty important for chronic pain disorders, um, we think. Um, because these neurons are normally uh, mechanically insensitive, but when you expose them to inflammatory mediators, they acquire a, a really robust mechanical sensitivity. So um, mouse silent nociceptors do exist, but they, they seem to have quite different properties than what we've learned from um, human silent nociceptors. And from uh, many uh, microneurography studies that have been done by people like uh, Barbara Nehmer and uh, Martin Schmelz in uh, Germany, we know that um, people that have neuropathic pain disorders, these silent nociceptors appear to develop spontaneous activity. So this particular neuronal population is probably a really, really important one to target um, in uh, people with chronic pain disorders because it seems to be driving at least some of the uh, underlying uh, pain that they have. So uh, in humans, like mice, these neurons express the alpha-3 uh, nicotinic receptor, which seems to be a pretty specific marker for this neuronal population across um, species. But they also have very uh, distinct properties in humans. So for instance, they express CCK, which uh, mouse DRG neurons don't express CCK at all. And they also express some receptors that are very specifically found in the itch uh, nociceptors in mice, but it turns out that in humans that receptor expression um, is in a broader population. And in fact, we know that itch mediators can sensitize um, uh, uh, silent nociceptors in human because histamine is one of the most robust um, kind of molecules that you can use to transition these uh, neurons from being mechanically insensitive to mechanically um, sensitive. So we think we have a pretty good handle on the um, broad kind of transcriptome of these neurons and, and some interesting targets have, have emerged from that analysis. Another one that I want to highlight here are these proenkephalin positive nociceptors. These are important because there doesn't seem to be any um, uh, population that resembles this in other species where we have single cell um, sequencing data. So these uh, neurons express uh, proenkephalin, which is an opioid peptide. They also express uh, granzyme B and uracortin. Uracortin is an agonist of uh, corticotropin uh, receptors and is involved in the stress response. And of course, as many of you know, that you know, stress and pain um, intersect um, pretty profoundly in many people with chronic pain. Now, I, I don't know that uracortin release from these neurons is, is, plays an important role there, but it's certainly an interesting testable hypothesis, which you couldn't approach in rodents because uh, this neuronal population doesn't seem to exist um, in rodents. And I'll come back to some evidence that this um, population might play an important role in human neuropathic pain, at least in women. <laughs> 
So um, because of the really great work of uh, people ranging from Jose Ochoa uh, several decades ago uh, to Bar Barbara Namer's uh, group uh, with uh, Herman Handworker and others, we know a fair amount about the pharmacology of uh, human silent nociceptors. So you know we can test whether or not our sequencing data makes sense in the context of what we already know about this normal population. And this data actually lines up beautifully. So we, we have, a, I think, a really solid um, uh, premise to think that you know this sequencing data aligns very nicely with the, the functionality of these neurons. So what's the evidence of that? So first of all, there is uh, very strong evidence that silent nociceptors in human respond in humans respond to trp one agonist, trp one agonist, but do not respond to cold. And in fact, the human silent nociceptors express a lot of trp one, express very robust trp one, and they do not express trp eight at all. And this is based both on um, our Visium spatial sequencing data and uh, single nucleus <coughs> uh, data that was generated by Jackson Brower at uh, Dolgromics. So two def different sequencing techniques giving you exactly the same result. Uh, there are also many micronography experiments that have been done in humans uh, demonstrating um, uh, agonists of G-protein couple receptors that can transition these neurons from being mechanically insensitive to mechanically sensitive. And two of the best known uh, agonists are lysophosphatidic acid and histamine. So if you look at the GPCRs that are expressed by these neurons using both single nucleus and visium data, what you will find is that the histamine H1 receptor is the only histamine receptor that's expressed by these neurons, so almost certainly that's the receptor that mediates this effect. And for lysophosphatidic acid, the LPAR1 receptor is the only receptor that's found in this population. So LPAR1 is almost certainly the receptor that's responsible for uh, driving the LPA-induced effect in humans. So uh, the H1 receptor is not expressed in this population in mice, and it's a different lysophosphatidic acid receptor that's expressed in mice in this population. So again, you know, you really need the human data to understand what's, what's happening. The, the mouse data would not lead you to the right conclusion. So um, that's a kind of broad overview of the work that we're doing with the organ donor tissues, but we also are really interested in trying to understand what's happening in chronic pain patients. So um, to do that, we really had to turn to uh, relatively rare surgeries where uh, uh, patients are having a surgery in which the dorsal root ganglion is removed, allowing us to uh, do electrophysiology and also RNA sequencing. So this has all been a great collaboration with Pat Doherty's lab at MD Anderson um, Cancer Center. And Pradip DeRay, a computational biologist in my group, was really the one that got all this up and running. Uh, Pradip is now at Bristol-Myers Squibb uh, working in their uh, uh, genomics group. So um, we have a, a, a really uh, great um, uh, collaboration, like I just said, with the folks at MD Anderson, where we're working with patients that are having a surgery called thoracic vertebrectomy. So these patients are having the surgery mostly because they have um, cancer that's infiltrated their uh, thoracic uh, vertebrae, and uh, they need to essentially have their spine rebuilt because they're at a, a pretty high risk for a catastrophic spine injury, which would lead to paralysis. They only do the surgery if it's at the thoracic level. It's too, too risky to do at the lumbar or the uh, cervical level. So this is the reason we've only worked with thoracic DRGs. But uh, because you know, they do a lot of imaging beforehand, they know exactly how they're gonna rebuild their spine, and they know exactly which DRGs are gonna be taken out, we can um, phenotype the patients pretty carefully. We understand which um, dermatomes they do and do not have pain in, and then when the DRGs come out, we can sort them to the uh, pain-associated and the non-pain-associated DRGs. So one of the first things that we did in a paper that we published in Brain a couple years ago was to do patch clamp electrophysiology on the uh, DRG neurons associated with pain. And what we found was that in, in the dish, even you know, several days later, we could still see spontaneously active uh, neurons. It was about 20% of the nociceptors that were spontaneously active. I wish I could tell you which subset they, they are, but I, I don't actually know that. That's something Pat and I are still kind of actively uh, trying to figure out. But um, one thing you should note here is that uh, in addition to be sponta in being spontaneously active, there's another distinguishing electrophysiological feature of these neurons, and that is that their resting membrane potential is very unstable. So there's clearly something going on with potassium channels, probably potassium channels here, that leads to this instability in the resting membrane potential. And those fluctuations in the resting membrane potential seem to be what generates the spontaneous activity. 
So there's kind of two separate targetable mechanisms here. One, one is um, the um, uh, problems with the resting membrane potential and then the generation of the action potentials, which that part may be now 1.7 mediated. We, we don't know um, specifically, but that would kind of be my guess. And again, we see this in about 20% <coughs> of the neurons and it only happens in the pain DRGs. We just do not see the spontaneous activity in the non-pain DRGs. So it's really, really strong evidence that it's the spontaneous activity that drives neuropathic pain and, and uh, chronic pain or, or neuropathic pain patients. So uh, we just published this paper in, in also in Brain um, a couple months ago. Actually, just the full paper just was um, published online about a week ago, um, where we've done uh, bulk RNA sequencing on a pretty large number of samples now. It's about 70 samples. We've found that about 50 of them were um, actually analyzable uh, because they had a, a rich enough um, neuronal content. We don't know why some of them um, didn't seem to have any neurons because you know we're pretty sure we actually got the DRG. Could be that there was you know profound necrosis of the neurons and we you know just couldn't detect it we're not quite sure uh, but anyway in, in the paper we described the full analysis of, of the um, um, 50 drgs that were sequenced and um, turned out that to see differences between the pain and non-pain samples we had to segregate all the samples by sex so um, there are very cl clear genes that are upregulated in the pain samples but again it's a distinct set of genes from the between the males and the females. In the males, what we see um, when we focus on uh, ligands that can be acting on receptors that are expressed by nociceptors in the human DRG, we primarily see um, uh, IL-6 uh, family cytokines, but not IL-6 itself. So um, oncostatin M, uh, leukemia inhibitory factor, and then there are some chemokines like CCL3 that are upregulated and some EGFR um, uh, ligands like apiregulin. In the female DRGs, uh, we see a distinct set of um, chemokines like CCL19 and C CXCL10, um, but then we also see um, some genes that are associated with a very specific subset of nociceptors, and those are those proenkephalin nociceptors. So <coughs> granzyme B is highly upregulated and proenkephalin is highly upregulated. So we're really interested now in trying to understand how that particular subset of nociceptors might be changing in uh, uh, women that have uh, neuropathic pain, because we just don't see those genes changing in um, men that have neuropathic pain. So I, I wish I could tell you exactly what the answer to that is, but I can't. Um, but now what I'm going to do is transition, you, transition to telling you a little bit about kind of where we're going with the, uh, the work that we're doing. So um, I'm going to tell you four uh, pretty quick stories, and one of them will um, involve um, the spinal cord. So if you guys were right, I will talk about the spinal cord. Not as much as my title implied that I would, but uh, we'll, we will talk about the spinal cord. Um, so first I'm going to tell, tell you a little bit about understanding um, uh, the underlying mechanisms of action of, a, of some new targets. So I, I just mentioned that one of the most highly upregulated targets in the male neuropathic pain samples was oncostatin M. So how does oncostatin M act on the human DRG? So Juliet Marighi, who's an amazing PhD student working with me, has done all this work. So the first question we wanted to address is where is the oncostatin M receptor expressed in, in the human DRG? So in mice, this receptor is only expressed in the itch population, and Mark Hoon at NIH has done amazing work showing how oncostatin M is involved in uh, itch, in um, chronic itch models in mice. In humans, the receptor is expressed by a much broader population of um, sensory neurons. It's found in the itch nociceptors. It's also found in the silent nociceptors. And what Juliet noted in our single cell sequencing data was that it also seems to be expressed in satellite glial cells. And in fact, when we do RNA scope, we see that there's very robust expression of the oncostatin M receptor in satellite glial cells. So she then wanted to understand um, what oncostatin M does to um, sensory neurons and what signaling mechanism it uses. So we've done patch clamp electrophysiology studies on DRGs from organ donors, and we see that oncostatin M has um, two very profound <coughs> physiological effects on um, sensory neurons. First, it creates a very unstable resting membrane potential. So this looks almost exactly like what we see in neuropathic pain patients. So it suggests that oncostatin M can be sufficient itself to cause this um, uh, particular problem. 
And then after some period of time, the neurons start to fire action potentials. So um, there is this, in this case, it's evoked by the oxytocin, but there's this discharge in the neurons that looks very much like what we see in these spontaneously active neurons. So we know from our previous work with IL-6 that IL-6 acts via MAP kinase signaling to um, increase excitability of rodent sensory neurons. So our hypothesis was that this pathway may be very similar in human DRG. So what Julia did uh, was to treat uh, uh, these same neurons with an inhibitor of mink, which is a downstream target of ERK, which we've done a lot of work on in, in preclinical models. And EFT508, which is a very specific mink inhibitor, completely blocks the effect of oncostatin M, both in um, changing the resting membrane potential and then causing the neurons to start firing action potentials. And uh, mink has a very specific target, that's EIF4E, which is an RNA binding protein that regulates translation. And we see that in um, explants from human DRG that are treated with oncostatin M, see a very robust increase in EIF4E phosphorylation in small diameter neurons and also satellite glial cells. So the signaling changes coincide almost exactly with where we see the receptor expression, which I think is um, very nice. That's how it probably should be. So uh, we think now we understand what oncostatin M does to human sensory neurons and how it signals. So um, where we're going with all that work is now to try to focus on some of the factors that are regulated in the female DRG, because we really don't know anything about those. So um, we're gonna start studying the, the chemokines that I just told you were upregulated. So um, we also are doing lots of target validation to try to better understand new disease mechanisms. So in the spirit of what Mike Iadarola talked about yesterday, that the target needs to be expressed, I'm gonna start with a negative example. So um, a lot of really great work has been done in the pain field on T-type calcium channels. Um, I even have a paper on T-type calcium channels in, in mouse DRG. But uh, those of you involved in drug discovery probably know that T-type calcium channel inhibitors have been developed and gone into the clinic and that they didn't work. So why did they not work? Well, uh, we did some pretty extensive um, RNA scope analysis on human DRGs looking at uh, T-type calcium gene expression in the human DRG. And it turns out, in particular for CAV 3.2, um, which is the, the target that the drugs were made against, that there's very, very little expression in human nociceptors. So it turns out that CAV 3.2 expression is really, really high in uh, proprioceptors and low threshold mechanoreceptors. Um, but there, while there is some sparse expression in some populations of nociceptors, the expression level is really low and most trpy one positive neurons in the human just don't express uh, the mRNA. So this is an example, I think, of a target that probably should have been deprioritized prior to going into the clinic because the expression level in humans just doesn't support uh, moving into clinical trials, and as we now know, the clinical trials were negative for uh, these inhibitors. So there's a negative example. Now let's have some positive examples. So NAV1.7, so um, we heard about this from Roz yesterday. Um, this is a target with as much genetic validation as you can possibly get. Um, Pat Doherty published a paper a couple years ago showing NAV1.7 was upregulated in human DRG from DRGs recovered from people that had chemotherapy neuropathy. So we looked in some of our thoracic vertebrectomy samples to see if NAV1.7 was also upregulated at the protein level. And here we found uh, with a pretty small sample size that there is a pretty robust upregulation of NAV1.7 protein. So th this is now a second study supporting the idea that NAV1.7 expression um, is increased in uh, DRG neurons of people with uh, neuropathic pain. One uh, area where we want to try to make as much headway as we can is uh, diabetic neuropathy. And for, for me, the, the reason for this is um, twofold. Um, one is that this is the largest population of people that have uh, neuropathic pain. And the other is that I just don't think the animal models are um, translatable. And you know, some of them, as you guys probably know, make the animals so sick, I just can't believe we do experiments on these animals at all. So um, we've had a really great opportunity starting with Anabios and now working with the Southwest Transplant Alliance to recover DRGs from organ donors who died with diabetic neuropathic pain. So the first experiments that we wanted to do in addition to the sequencing that we've been doing, which I'm not gonna tell you about because we're still trying to analyze all the data, 
um, was to um, replicate a previous finding from um, Sonny Anand's uh, lab that was um, published some years ago, but that was also supported by um, work that we did collaboratively with Ashok Kulkarni and also uh, Mike Adarola at NIH, where we saw that P2X3 was downregulated in bulk RNA sequencing from diabetic neuropathic pain DRGs. So uh, we did uh, P2X3 amino reactivity on um, DRGs from uh, individuals that died with diabetic neuropathic pain and saw essentially exactly what Sonny Anand had reported at the protein level, and that's that P2X3 uh, is downregulated in um, nociceptors of people with diabetic neuropathic pain. So this gave us confidence that what the tissues we were, were recovering, you know, we could have a reproducible result from um, previous literature. So we wanted to dive deeper and to try to understand the histopathological problems that have previously been reported in the DRG. So um, these are, are quite old studies, actually, where um, people used you know, just basic staining methods to look at pathology in, the, in diabetic neuropathy DRGs and uh, reported two major things. One are these kind of dystrophic axons. So believe it or not, this um, thing here is a, a piece of an axon that's basically grown this like large bleb. We, we thought that that can't possibly be right. These have to be like lipid droplets or something like that. So we've done a, a lot of immunohistochemistry with um, peripherin, which is a specific marker of um, uh, uh, neuronal axons. <coughs> And you can see that we see in these diabetic uh, DRGs, neuropathic pain DRGs, that there are a lot of these uh, blebs, and indeed they do seem to be axonal blebs because they contain uh, lots and lots of peripherin. And th these are found in essentially all of the diabetic uh, uh, neuropathy DRGs that we've um, looked at so far. And we, we rarely ever see these in, in normal DRGs, and we've done a lot of histology on uh, normal organ donor DRGs. So another thing that we have um, been looking at are these so-called nodes <coughs> of Najet. So one of the reasons that we focused on these is because they've been you know, classically reported in, in the much older literature on diabetic neuropathy. But again, in that paper that we published with Ashok and, and Mike, um, we saw that there were, were probably some specific populations of nociceptors that were dying in the diabetic um, DRG. And the idea about these Najet, Najet nodules is that there's proliferating satellite glial cells that are basically um, degrading uh, these uh, neurons that are dying. So here, here's a picture of what they look like from um, the classic uh, literature. And uh, we also um, see them in the diabetic DRG. Um, th th there are an awful lot of them. They're pretty easy to spot because it's an area that looks like it should be a neuron, but now there's tons of DAPI signal, which seems to be these proliferating um, uh, satellite glial cells. But the thing that Stephanie noticed when she was doing this immunohistochemistry was with peripherin was that there seemed to be lots of axons that are um, sprouting into there. So we thought, you know, m maybe these are um, sympathetic um, sprouting axons. But these, uh, you know, sympathetic sprouting has been reported in the rodent literature in lots of different types of neuropathic pain, mostly from work that was done by uh, Jim Chung. So we, we looked at TH staining, and uh, long story short, we saw no sympathetic sprouting in um, diabetic neuropathic pain, DRGs, but lots of peripheral um, sprouting here. So this has also been reported, although not as uh, Najet nodules in the kind of classic literature, um, but the idea in these old papers was that it was sympathetic sprouting. We're very confident now that it's not sympathetic sprouting. What it appears to be is sprouting of nociceptor axons around these satellite glial cells. So I, I personally think this is probably really important for the um, underlying mechanisms of diabetic neuropathic pain because it's basically little neuromas f forming within the DRG. And if it, anybody is familiar with what happens in many neuropathic pain patients that have neuromas, these neuromas become mechanically sensitive and sites of um, uh, discharge that cause this kind of electrical shooting pain that many uh, patients with neuropathic pain have. So we think that these, these proliferating satellite glial cells may be producing signals that then cause these neurons to sprout and then also become sites of electrogenesis within the uh, DRG. So we're trying to now use spatial RNA sequencing to better understand uh, what happens in these neurons. So, um, Another uh, really interesting thing about the human DRG is that it's full of immune cells. And um, rodent DRGs are, you know, they have some immune cells, but not a very large number. This is something that we noticed um, 
basically right off the bat when we were doing our single cell RNA sequencing, saw a fair number of neurons, as, as one would expect, although the neurons are pretty hard to get with the um, single nucleus sequencing technologies, but many labs, including ours, have kind of worked this out now. But we were very surprised at how many immune cells were here, and in particular, we were surprised by how many T cells were in the DRG. So one thing that we have been doing a lot of, and in fact, we just have a paper published in uh, Journal of Neurotrauma, uh, where this T cell data is uh, there, is uh, using markers for macrophages and T cells to look at their location within the human DRG. So uh, macrophages seem to accumulate around the neurons and they intersperse themselves with the satellite glial cells. So, um, and our, our spatial sequencing data also supports this. And this is even in you know, normal organ donor DRGs. The thing that was a little bit more surprising was how many T cells were in the DRG. So uh, we looked at uh, CD4 and CD8 T cells and um, basically what we found is that the, these T cells are interspersed about equally spaced between um, uh, the neurons. We don't know exactly why they're there, but you know, in the rodent DRG, in the app, uh, without an injury, there are essentially no um, T cells within the DRG, but there seem to be resident T cells uh, within the human DRG. So one of the really great things that you can do with a mix of um, spatial and single cell RNA sequencing data is to use that data to kind of deconvolute um, uh, your um, spatial data and then look at interactions between cells for um, ligands and um, receptors. So Deanna has been working on this using a variety of different tools. One of the ones that we really like is called um, Giotto. So because we have our um, spatial data and lots of single cell RNA sequencing data, we can kind of integrate these with each other and then we can cluster um, barcodes by what kind of cell type is the most um, uh, prominent within that particular barcode. And then we can place these barcodes in space so you can see you know, where the neurons, where the T cells, et cetera. And one thing I think is kind of easy to appreciate here, if you can figure out where the T cells are, they're in, they're in red, the neurons are in uh, purple and pink, is that the T cells are, are pretty much intertwined with the neurons, well, there's, there are some areas where there's you know, a lot of T cells, but not that many neurons, but they're, they're very well intertwined here. So then we can use um, ligand receptor uh, interactomes that we've, we've built um, to look at what ligands are coming from the T cells that can be acting on receptors that are expressed by the nociceptors uh, within uh, space. And, and we can rank things by their spatial arrangement. So when we do this, what we find is that um, the ligands that are, are potentially coming from the T cells uh, acting on receptors and the nociceptors are things that nobody has really studied before in the pain field. So the two most prominent ones are VGF, which actually has been studied a little bit by Lucy Volchanova at uh, University of Minnesota, but in a, a much different um, context. And then another gene called neuronal growth regulator 1. Um, those are both you know, pretty highly expressed by the T cells. and um, there are receptors for these and the neurons that are very close to those T cells. So we're now prioritizing trying to understand how these factors might be signaling um, within the uh, human DRG. All right, so now I'm gonna wrap up and tell you a quick story about the spinal cord, with, which Rod has already <coughs> talked about a little bit, um, centered around now 1.7. So um, we have been doing a, a lot of um, single cell and spatial RNA sequencing on the human spinal cord, but we got scooped by Ariel Levine from NIH who just published a really great paper in Neuron. Um, her, if you haven't seen her paper already, I, I would encourage you to go check it out if you're interested in the human spinal cord. It's a terrific paper. She also made an a, a, a online resource to do gene searches that's very similar to our sens sensoriomics um, website. So it's a great resource to look any gene that you're interested in. When we were doing our single cell sequencing on the human spinal cord, one thing that stuck out immediately was that there was tons of NAV, tons of NAV 1.7 expression. And this really confused us at first. Thought maybe we sequenced the wrong tissue. <laughs> maybe we were getting, you know, axon blebs or something like that, and it was showing up as single nuclei. We just could not figure it out. So we said, the only way we're gonna know what this is is if we do RNA scope. So we started doing our RNA scope for NAV 1.7, and we were pretty much completely blown away with what we saw. So in the human spinal cord, there's really a lot of NAV 1.7 expressing cells. Almost all of them are pretty big, so you can kind of see them here, but you can see them uh, better here. And as Raj talked about yesterday, this paper's up on BioArchives, so if you want to look for yourself, 
um, that we've, we've already published the, or, or put the preprint up. Um, it turns out that most of the NI1.7 exp expressing cells also express the NK1 receptor, TACR1 receptor. So, you know, the fact that these neurons are big and the fact that they express TACR1 very highly suggests that they're projection neurons. So projection neurons are the neurons that receive the input from the inner neurons within the spinal cord and also from the afferents that are coming in and then send the signal up on up to the brain. So these neurons are really important because they're the output um, uh, circuit for the spinal cord to, to send the pain signal to the brain, which you ultimately need to you know, ha have the perception of pain. So we see these neurons not only in lamina 1 and lamina 2, where we know there should be projection neurons, but also in lamina 5 and lamina 6. So in rodents, there are no projection neurons in the, in the really deep dorsal horn, but in humans, there are, um, also in non-human primates. And again, there are these big neurons that express both um, NAV1.7 and uh, TACR1. So we're pretty convinced that NAV1.7 um, is expressed by projection neurons. And another experiment that we did, and it, it, yeah, it kind of shows up. So um, here you can see uh, the anterior commissure of the spinal cord. So projection neurons from lamina 1 and from deep lamina cross at the level at which uh, the second order neurons are found, and then they ascend in the contralateral um, spinal thalamic tract, which is down here. So crossing axons in the spinal cord are mostly projection neurons. There's some other subtypes that uh, cross, but you know the, the major ones are the projection neurons. And you can see in axons here, NAV1.7 amino reactivity. So I think that this again is really good indication that these projection neurons express uh, NAV1.7. So Stephanie, uh, wanted to dive a little bit deeper in looking where uh, NAV1.7 was expressed in these neurons. So she looked at both dendritic uh, fields and in axons. And, you know, our, our axons crossing would suggest that NAV1.7 is primarily in axons of these neurons. And in fact, if you look at anchor G, which is a marker of the uh, uh, axon initial segment, uh, so this is here coming off a very large neuron in lamina 1. Uh, there is uh, amino activity for NAV1.7 all over the axon initial segment of these neurons. So this suggests that NAV1.7 may also play an important role in the um, input-output function of these neurons because sodium channels at the um, axon initial segment are really important for integrating depolarization and leading to the neurons generating the action potential. So another thing that we've been trying to do in the spinal cord is to understand the synaptic um, arrangement of uh, incoming afferents onto second order neurons in the spinal cord. So Olivia Davis is a new postdoc with my group. She came from Andrew Todd's lab in Glasgow. So one of the best spinal cord labs in the world. And one thing that Olivia <coughs> has been uh, focusing on in her work in our lab is um, these so-called synaptic glomeruli. So these synaptic glomeruli are found in um, lamina 1, lamina 2 of the spinal cord and, and rodents. And they're interesting that they're basically large presynaptic boutons of non-peptidergic neurons that have a large um, uh, number of postsynaptic densities around them. So it's basically one synapse forming lots of synapses on um, second order neurons. And again, in rodents, they're all non-peptidergic. There are no peptidergic synaptic glomeruli. So in humans, are they peptidergic or non-peptidergic? Well, every single one of these that we've found so far contains CGRP. So fundamentally different from rodents again. Um, and this is very consistent with what I kind of started the talk with, that um, there really don't seem to be non-peptidergic neurons in, in human beings. They're all um, peptidergic. So we heard from Mike about CGRP actions in the human spinal cord, I think this is gonna be a really important area and you know, maybe fundamentally different from uh, what we see in rodents, at least in, in some uh, aspects. So I'm gonna uh, stop there, but thank you all for your attention. I, I do wanna point out that NIH's uh, support of our work has just been absolutely amazing. We can't do any of this uh, without them, so thank you, Michael, in particular for, yeah. and uh, also, the Southwest Transplant Alliance, uh, who we've done all of this uh, work with, with the organ donors, they've, they've turned into um, just amazing partners in the work that we do, and uh, I want to thank the families and the donors, too. And uh, all of our work is done at the Center for Advanced Pain Studies at UTD, which was co-founded by uh, myself, Michael Burton, and uh, Greg Dussour. Thank you. Do we have time for questions?
Great talk, Ted. Um, I don't think I have to say more. I think we're all in agreement on that, so thanks. Let's, um, I want to ask you about the, um, I know you mentioned they're all peptidergic. In humans and in vertebrates, there's usually co-transmission with a classical transmitter and a peptidergic transmission. Is that the case here also? So you have glutamate and CGRP? Yeah, so um, I think that's almost certainly the case. The, the thing that is really, really striking as well about the human DRG is the number of peptides that are expressed by these neurons. So there's CGRP, there's substance P, there's um, uricordin, there's uh, CCK, there's somatostatin, there's NPPB. The list goes on and on and on. And, you know, CGRP seems to be in all of the populations, but many of the other peptides are found in very specific populations. So one of the things that we're um, super interested in trying to understand is, you know, do, do these play an important role in synaptic transmission in the spinal cord, or are they more like efferent transmitters that act on immune cells? I mean, we're learning tons about how the sensory system plays a super important role in, in immune, autoimmune diseases, et cetera. So I, I think that's gonna be an area that is like really ripe for investigation and you wouldn't be able to do any of those experiments in rodents because a lot of these neuropeptides are not expressed by rodent sensory neurons. Hi. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm curious to know what you think uh, the sequence of events are um, regarding the satellitosis that mm -hmm. occurs. And so are they, are they heading towards death? <laughs> are they injured and they're going to die? Or are they hanging around and they're just going to be dysfunctional? That's a great question that we don't know the answer to. So I think that the way to get at that is to use the um, spatial sequencing data because, you know, these, um, uh, First of all, there's a, there's a lot of them in the diabetic DRGs. We, we have quite a few samples now, and they do you know, tend to far, fall on single barcodes, so we can get pretty deep information from them. So you know, I, I, I have to admit also, I keep saying they're proliferating satellite glial cells. I don't actually know that they're satellite glial cells. I mean, I, that's a presumption that we're making, but until we actually get the, all the sequencing data back, don't know that for sure. They, they could be macrophages, they could be, uh, they could be T cells. Um, so we, we don't really know. There clearly is something coming from them that causes the neurons to sprout like crazy though because the, the amount of these very thin axons that are there that we, we thought must be sympathetic but c clearly are not. Um, there's gotta be some kind of um, growth factor or other substance that comes from them that causes the, the neurons to form these am amazing sprouts. So the, the last thing is I don't know if those sprouting is coming from adjacent neurons or if it's that neuron itself that's kind of losing its projection and then it's just forming this kind of, you know, tanglement of um, axons. So, you know, that would be pretty important to know from the perspective of how the signaling works. So, you know, if it's, if it's the neuron itself forming all this and it becomes electrically active, you would imagine it'd be spilling stuff out all over the place. If it's other neurons coming in and sprouting <coughs> in, you would imagine there's something specific coming from those cell types that causes the electrogenesis and, you know, Treating that would be fundamentally different. Dave. Um, that was awesome talk. Thank you. Um, so most of my questions were already answered a second ago, but <laughs> having to do with these, these uh, pericellular sprouts and awesome showing a 1908, you know, paper from that. That's cool. But I was just wondering, sort of beyond that, can you conceive of sort of an evolution, evolutionary point to all the work that has to go into making those sprouts around the ghost? Yeah, I, I, I don't have a good idea right now. Um, you know, uh, diabetes obviously creates like a, a major uh, metabolic change. And um, you could imagine that, uh, you know, something within the neurons is changing in response to the very high glucose level, but it seems to be a very specific subset of neurons that's changing. So it kind of doesn't make sense that it's from the hyperglycemia that this is happening, because you would imagine that would target all the neurons and not a specific subset of neurons. And we think the specific subset of neurons is the trip one expressing cells. So why exactly that particular subtype seems to be so affected, I don't have a good idea. I mean, it could, could be reactive oxygen, reactive nitrogen, and that that, that particular subset is very um, uh, susceptible to that. 
but yeah, I, I just don't know. Well, if, if we knew everything, we wouldn't have jobs. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great point. Cool stuff. Uh, three points to the story is pretty interesting. So, Emmanuel Barney, uh, Geralt from Pony, and many of, many of the labs have campaigns for 3.2 yeah. compounds. So, the fact that it's not in the RG is interesting. Um, is it in Spellcore? That's a good question. Um, you can look at Ariel's data. <laughs> I, I don't know off the top of my head. I mean, um, so the, the T type calcium channels are pretty pretty broadly expressed in the nervous system. I mean, I guess the major question is, you know, why did that uh, the previous clinical trials fail? It could be the case that it was a, a bad drug. So like like I think the, the Pfizer 1.7 inhibitor we all kind of know now was a bad drug. But um, I don't I don't know if the T type calcium channel inhibitors that went in the clinic were bad drugs too. Like they had poor pharmacokinetic properties. But you know those those clinical trials were as negative as they get. So um, I probably would not spend a lot of time working on that target. Yeah. So I was equally surprised with the one seven expression in spinal cord. Mm -hmm. This is a great paper. Um, we're trying to reconcile with the, the human 1.7 knockouts, right? So they, some of their sensory systems are intact. They can still feel touch, they can still feel proprioception, et cetera. Mm -hmm. the, that information coming into the spinal cord, going through projection neurons, should be integrated. I mean, how, how important do you think that expression in the projection neurons relates to the loss of, of pain yep, so in, the sense, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the human knockouts? Is it more peripheral major or central right here, which is... Yeah, so I, I guess I have two comments on that. So for the proprioceptors, you know, that go up in the dorsal columns, we don't really see NAV 1.7 in the um, axons that are going up in the dorsal column. So I, I, don't, I don't think that um, you would expect those to be affected in people with the loss of function mutations. Um, in terms of the gain of function mutation, you know, uh, Salaman, Dib Hodge, Steve Waxman, and Clifford Wolf. You know, they, they all, um, or both groups, I think, independently made mice with the gain-of-function mutation, and it didn't have a pain phenotype. But NAV 1.7 isn't really expressed in this population in the spinal cord in mice. So one uh, potential explanation for the, that disconnect between the gain-of-function mutation in, in mice and the lack of a phenotype is that you really need to have the combined gain-of-function in the peripheral nervous system and the projection neurons to cause the enhanced um, pain phenotype. Uh, now, obviously that's just a hypothesis and we don't even know that the NAV 1.7 is functional in the um, human spinal cord neurons, but I imagine you know, there are lots of people that are gonna wanna answer that question in relatively short order. Yes, thank you. Thanks. Ted, with uh, the vertebrectomy patients, mm -hmm. is, is one thoracic DRG taken or both? No, so we, we typically take uh, four to six uh, DRGs in that surgery. Um, oftentimes people will um, have pain in all of those dermatomes or don't have pain in any of the dermatomes. I mean, more, more often people do have pain than don't have pain. Occasionally we have people that have pain on one side and not on the other. Those are kind of the most interesting ones to analyze. Um, we have some additional analysis on that in the, in the brain uh, paper. Um, but yeah, it's typically four to six. How do they function without those DRGs? So they, they, they lose um, sensation in that area of their back, but uh, otherwise um, are uh, normal. Now, I mean, th th these are, though, pretty extreme patients. Yeah. I mean, they have, they have advanced cancer. Um, they're taking chemotherapeutics. Um, it, it, it's amazing when you see the imaging from these patients that some of them don't have pain. Honestly, I mean that, that actually is one of the things we're trying to study now is, is whether or not there are pain suppressing factors that are in the in the DRG of some of the people that don't have pain, but we don't have uh, much data on that now. We're, we're just now starting to do more comparison of thoracic DRGs from organ donors to the thoracic vertebrectomy DRGs. Our organ donor work is mostly focused on lumbar DRGs so far. Right. Is there a question up here? So. Uh, your evidence would suggest about the sprouting around the degenerating neurons that the region of spontaneous generation of pain in diabetic peripheral neuropathy is, is maybe moved to the dorsal ganglion mm -hmm. rather than abnormal afferent endings in the skin. 
Would you agree with that? Yes, I agree with that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that is supported by where people often do nerve blocks. So they're more efficacious if you do it at, at the DRG than if you try to do them like the popliteal fossa or something like that. Any other questions? Yeah. Right, Ted. Um, you showed that in mice, you don't have these sort of T cell, CD4, CD8 uh, infiltrates. Do you know any information about the activation status of those cells in humans? Are they naive or memory T cells? Yeah, so, um, so CD4 and CD8 T cells, I think, can infiltrate the DRG after injury, but they, they're not in, in rodents, but they're typically not found in the DRG prior to an injury. So um, we're trying to do some stuff with Isaac Chu now to look at this. So I, Isaac is a very well-known neuroimmunologist, works in the pain field, we've collaborated with him a lot. So his, his idea, which is supported by Mike's data and our data from sequencing, is that the reason there are T cells in the human DRG is because all of us have been exposed to lots of viruses. And some of the viruses sit dormant within the DRG. So the T cells are there creating interferon gamma that's um, you know, suppressing the, um, the, the viruses within the DRG. Mm. So uh, that's something that we're actively looking at, but you know, we, don't, we, we don't know at this point. It raises another interesting question though. Um, there's a surprising number of viruses that you find in sequencing data in the human DRG, and um, not all of them are the ones that we talk about a lot, you know? So it's possible that uh, some uh, infections, viral infections, could be leading to chronic pain susceptibility, um, and, you know, the neuroimmune interactions that would occur maybe specifically within the DRG that you would have no other way of knowing about because you're not going to sample the DRG um, from, from the vast majority of chronic pain patients um, could potentially be you know, very important in the underlying pathogenesis. Anyone else? Great talk, Ted. Um, for the NAV 1.7 findings, really cool. Have you looked at the other sodium channels? Like, do you think it's specific? Because I think you found some other, like didn't you see high trip B1 in the, in the human spinal cord neurons? Like I'm just wondering if some of these peripheral targets are, are more expressed in the- Yeah, so we've, um, we looked at um, NAV 1.8 and there's none. Okay. Um, there is trip B1 in the human spinal cord, but in our hands it's in astrocytes. Um, not, not, not neurons. Um, I, I don't know if it's functional in astrocytes or not, but we see, we see mRNA in astrocytes. Um, P2X3, we don't see any in the spinal cord. So I think, you know, of, of the peripherally restricted targets, uh, NAV 1.7 is really the only one that seems to be, you know, pretty highly expressed in these spinal cord neurons. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Thanks Appreciate it.